Good day, everyone. My name is David Williams, Executive Director of the International Association for Energy Economics. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar entitled The Texas Grid Failure. We're grateful to Mr. Ed Hurs for today's timely discussion. First, a little bit about the International Association for Energy Economics. We are the largest association specializing in the field of energy economics and provide a forum for the exchange of ideas, experience and issues among professionals interested in the field. The organization produces two professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations, mm -hmm. along with a host of other products and services that you can find at our website, www.iaee.org. If you're not already a member of the association, we welcome you to join. A few housekeeping matters in regard to today's webinar before I hand things over to our speaker. First, this webinar is being recorded for those that cannot participate in today's live event. If you have any questions for our speaker, please use Zoom's Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window to type your question. We've allocated sufficient time at the end of this webinar to address your questions. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to uh, our presenter, Mr. Ed Hurst, co-founder of Zero Carbon Cycle and a very good friend of mine. Ed, over to you. Thank you, Dave. I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, and let's see, we've got the uh, screen set. Uh, are we good with that? Good. Uh, I'm assuming everyone can see the screen. Uh, we, we don't quite see your, your presentation, Ed. Uh, oh, maybe okay. share the screen? Yeah, let me do that. I, we, we had it. I guess, oh, I know what happened off there we are there you go all right we were set before and then the video got it so there we go okay uh, thank you very much Dave and, and uh, um, so this is going to kind of be in a, a formal informal workshop type discussion and I'm going to talk about the Texas grid failure and and in particular how we saw this coming how this was uh, in many respects, very, very avoidable. Uh, and yet uh, the Texas leadership uh, decided to, to forge ahead. Uh, you know, as, as, as economists, we can, we can only hope to be right a few times in our career. You know, um, that's uh, unfortunately the situation uh, we find ourselves in here today. So, so what happened in ERCOT? And, um, you know, here's, here's the, the if you will, the, the, the chart of the crash. Um, uh, moving along at uh, uh, 60 gigs, uh, plus or minus here in uh, uh, this very cold day in February, uh, we, we wound up with a polar vortex. Uh, there was a demand spike, of course, and uh, then we began to get generation outages as uh, equipment failed, as equipment froze, as, as, uh, as natural gas lines uh, appear to have frozen. Um, we're not really altogether sure about that because the postmortem on, on what occurred is still kind of trickling out. We know that some of the gas producers uh, uh, shut in because they were uh, unable to weatherize. Uh, I, I also know that one gas producer went to the dollar store and, and bought $39 worth of shower vinyl uh, shower curtains, wrapped his well heads with those, and um, made a huge amount of money all in the space of three or four days. Uh, and, and then there are scurrilous rumors about that some of the producers withheld gas in order to keep the price high over this period of time. Uh, we don't know what's going to, to come out from that. Um, there was an analysis this, earlier this week that showed that a lot of $11 billion went to uh, uh, in any, any event, as as uh, very very close to uh, getting to a point where it was going to be a, a black start, uh, uh, CEO Magnus pointed out that there was uh, uh, four minutes between uh, when they they began these shutdowns and uh, a complete loss of the grid. 
uh, which would have taken months and months to uh, recover from. Uh, now, no one. I'm I'm hearing somebody on here, uh, and no one's really quite certain why that's the particular case. You know, Texas doesn't have a, a Black Star fleet in place. Um, you know, ten years ago, uh, ERCOT had had said that they could get back within within less than a day uh, from a Black Star. Um, you know, in the in the uh, roadmap that ERCOT released yesterday. They called a, a black start event a one in a million outcome, uh, but that, of course, one in a million has happened in Southern California and in the Northeast on occasions. Yeah, you know, so there's all sorts of, of odd uh, information kind of uh, flying around right now. Uh, uh, the ERCOT CEO maxed the price out at, at nine thousand dollars, took it to the cap um, uh, that that Monday night. Um, we're not uh, absolutely certain who was on the call with that. We do know that State Senator Hancock has called out various conflicts of interest. Um, there's been no reporting on this, but uh, going to $9,000 a megawatt hour, knowing full well that some of the generation was never going to come back online over that period of time uh, seems kind of odd. Uh, the independent market monitor uh, instantly, uh, if you will, by Friday of that week, said that $16 billion of charges were were out, out of bounds. Um, the new interim CEO of, of ERCOT says that ERCOT violated its own rules. Um, there's, you know, still going to be just a huge amount of, of, of uh, uh, disputes yet going on. And so a week later, you know, we're kind of back to normal. Um, we're, we're seeing uh, uh, wind, coal, uh, solar, hydro, everything performing relatively nominally. Uh, one of the, the points that I gleaned from the uh, testimonies that CEO Magnus said that the uh, ERCOT grid was 95% likely not to have had a, a bad event. And I think this is where you get to uh, question some of the the overall strategies involved with with managing a grid. Um, so if we look at, at what happened in, in 2011, we had a grid failure. Uh, and not quite as widespread here, but uh, it, it did cause all sorts of, of issues and challenges, especially when the uh, uh, shutdowns and the blackouts dropped right over the med center in Dallas. Uh, if we just take a look at what happened in 2011 and the report and uh, uh, do a global search and replace with, with 2021, we're probably pretty close to getting there. Um, we know that the uh, estimated cost of preparation uh, for the grid in terms of winterizing or weatherizing the facilities would have been you know, anywhere from 400 million to, to 1.2. Um, some of the good numbers are about 600. Uh, the losses, uh, the state just revised its its numbers to 210 uh, from 154. Uh, one of the media outlets has, has said there were more than 700 dead. Um, 50 billion in the ERCOT physical market, uh, 90 to 200 billion in property losses. Uh, it's hard to say uh, what these numbers are yet because again, um, you know, I, I think back to the, the shootout scene uh, from the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, Clint Eastwood, Tuco, and, and Lee Van Cleef, the music playing, and the three of them looking at each other. On on one hand, one's going to have to shoot the other. On the other, one's an ally. Multiply that by 30, put ERCOT in the middle, and that's the way the litigation is about to shape up here in, in Texas. Every major law firm is involved. Um, you know, wind, wind electricity producers who had contracted with gas producers to provide backup, uh, they were shortchanged. Uh, the wind guys have been sued because they didn't provide the power. They have a daisy chain of a lawsuit against the gas players. It's it's a it's a mess and it's a field day for for litigators. Um, so in addition to these these costs, uh, we've got a national security vulnerability and a competitive disadvantage for the state that really the leadership in Austin's not spent a whole lot of time thinking about. Uh, but if we had 26 million people in the United States without power for an extended period of time, 
Yeah, we're not talking hours and days and weeks. We're, you know, as as Urquhart said, months. That would make 26 million people of, of the 29 million in Texas a ward of the nation. Yeah, the 82nd, the 101st, uh, the SEALs, uh, the Rangers, they would all be coming to Texas with water bottles. Uh, we wouldn't be able to drive out of town because there'd be no power to, to lift the fuel in the pumps. Um, no food, uh, health care, uh, you know, your iPhones would work. You know, and, and there's such a, a, a just a cognitive dissonance here that it's, it's really remarkable uh, that nobody's really focused on this, this you know, big fat tail event, if you will, in terms of loss. Um, the, the Dallas Fed and, and Jesse Thompson, who may be on this call, have put together a, a study that showed that the supply chain interruption with uh, Texas and the petrochemical and refining industries probably won't be restored until early 2022. Um, you know, if the colonial pipeline was a, was a small precursor or, or uh, uh, forecast of the, the damage, then we could really uh, imagine what would happen with the petrochemical industry and the refining industry for, for half the nation's supply shut down. Uh, for an extended period of time. These plants don't have sufficient backup generation to maintain operations. And in any event, uh, the supply chain to them of feedstock would be disrupted. They'd be taken offline in, in any other way. Um, this makes Texas a, a, a critically weak component of, of national infrastructure. And I'm, uh, this, is, this is something that really needs to be addressed. Um, Additionally, it's a competitive disadvantage. Uh, Arizona, well, Oklahoma's already won uh, one large company that had been considering moving to Texas. I think we have um, uh, others that are, are deeply concerned. Uh, uh, Elon Musk tweeted from his, his garage in Austin. Uh, about being cold um, and uh, you know, this is billions and billions of dollars. And, and quite honestly, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Carolinas, any place with a, with a more traditionally managed market is using the legislative hearings as their economic development argument. So if we go back just to the, the economic side of things, and um, I've been doing this uh, since the 70s, um, regulatory policies, of course, were designed to prevent the exercise of monopoly power. And, and as a result, there was this very cumbersome, but, but well-orchestrated ballet between the regulated utilities and the public utility commissions. I mean, many, many of young economists were trained to fill these, these eight inch binders of, of justifications and, and adding uh, assets to the rate base. Um, making sure that depreciation and reinvestment was covered, and um, and also making sure that you know famously the the CEO's executive assistant's birthday party wasn't part of the the rate base. Um, and as we know, electricity de deregulation began pretty much in the in the late seventies. Uh, Paul McAvoy, who was on the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, began the, to lead the, the, the push for deregulating regulated industries. Uh, trucking, um, he used to tell a great story about how the, the, the head of the Teamsters visited with him. Um, and uh, electricity markets, airlines came about later, uh, oil and gas, uh, the deregulation of the gas markets began when a, when a um, uh, a lovely older person in, in uh, Massachusetts was curtailed in uh, 70s, 74, 75 that winter. And uh, she called her son, uh, Ted, and said, I'm cold. And uh, he called uh, Jerry and said, mom's cold. And, and Jerry called McAvoy down the hall and said, find out why Rose Kennedy is cold. And, and the story goes that uh, McAvoy met with Senator Kennedy and explained 
you know, look, you've capped the price of natural gas at 95 cents an MCF, and it takes those boys in Texas a buck 25 an MCF to get it out of the ground. And, and so there was a realization, a bipartisan realization at that time, that deregulation needed to, to occur. Australia led the way with deregulating electricity markets. Uh, that was closely followed by California with, with Assembly Bill 1890 and what was it, 1993, which was pretty much implemented in 1996. Uh, the, the vertically integrated utilities were, were split apart. And the different markets uh, developed. Um, and we saw, of course, the, the challenges in, in the California market in 2000, 2001. That led to the recall election of Governor Gray Davis, the election of Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, Enron explained to us how you could game one of these markets. Um, it actually, uh, with their, their various trading strategies, including Get Shorty, uh, allowed uh, Enron to survive an extra year more on the hundreds of billions of dollars they made by taking advantage of the California PUC and uh, CAISO. Uh, again, as we kind of look at that structure, it's, it's a little different. Uh, the, the retail price was capped in California. We, uh, but the utilities in particular PG&E had been promised that if they kept generating, they would recover their cost. Uh, PG&E had to, had to file for bankruptcy. You know, had, has this type of thing occurred uh, in other markets? Yeah, kind of. Uh, we had the uh, oil embargo uh, in 1974, and that uh, many people you know, persist in believing the myth that there was uh, the gasoline lines uh, because of the oil embargo, and that's not altogether true. Uh, what happened is that Nixon's wage and price controls uh, cap, cap the price that the retail fuel could be sold. And so the refiners really couldn't buy crude oil from abroad, refine it and sell it into the U.S. market at a uh, profit. So they stopped refining um, uh, rather than just go into bankruptcy on behalf of, of a grateful nation. Uh, so again, really a, an, an interesting issue of governance. Uh, we began to, to look at this in 2013 and uh, focused on uh, what we saw was the, the flawed ERCOT market. Uh, our, our first piece, uh, which, which ran in 2013, was entitled ERCOT. The editor of the Houston Chronicle thought that this title might be uh, a bit inflammatory. So instead, what he, he went with was Texas suffers from a Soviet-style uh, electricity distribution system. And uh, here's where we laid out our, our arguments going forward. And, and as a, I, I, I was extremely fortunate to attend Yale. And so I got to meet a bunch of really great economists. The first I'll, I'll talk about here is, is Charlene Koopmans. And as uh, many of you will know, um, he was the co-winner of the Nobel Prize in 1975. And this is for his use of linear programming. Um, the, the, he, he did not accept the, the prize money. Instead, he gave it to George Danzig and, and founded the Danzig Institute. Um, uh, Danzig is the guy who developed the technique of linear programming or, or linear optimization. Uh, and Koopmans had simply applied it. Uh, his co-winner, Kantorovich, uh, protested uh, all throughout the, the award ceremony that he was only a physicist that he was really not the guy in charge of centrally planning the Soviet Union's economy, uh, which of course, well, it was his model. And, and the shortfalls of the linear programming model were really pretty straightforward. Uh, number one, it's, it's, it's not a time varied model. Number two, it doesn't have anything for uh, return on capital. Uh, number three, uh, it, 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 it's not multidimensional. And so stressing, if you will, for weather events was a real problem. And of course, the Soviet crop failures uh, pointed out the shortcomings of, of these particular models. Uh, furthermore, uh, you know, what, what the Texas legislature, the PUC and ERCOT had done was they, they essentially created a monopsony. 
And I mean, we can go all the way back to the 30s with Joan Robinson's work um, and with a company town. Uh, we could talk about baseball, which we'll get to, and the reserve clause. Um, but in a, in a, a monopsony with one buyer, there's a, a tremendous tendency for suppliers to this, this one buyer to uh, compete to the point where they're, they're barely covering variable cost. Um, uh, and, and so the Texas model, of course, was, was pointed more towards uh, marginal cost and, and marginal cost pricing rather than trying to cover uh, average total cost. There was, there was no, no ability to, to account for uh, necessary capital investment. Now, in, in the old school with the, the utility generation fleet overbuilt, you know, when Ken Lay went to see Governor Bush and say, hey, look, you've got, you're, you're paying 12 months out of the year for a plant that's only operational one month out of the year, uh, you know, maybe we don't need 99.9999% uh, reliability. Maybe just, you know, 98% reliability will work or 95% reliability will work. Um, you know, Enron didn't do anything for, for its health. Um, McAvoy and Joskow, in particular, in, in the 06 07 uh, uh, timeframe, began to point to the fact that these partially deregulated markets would, uh, in effect, be regulated markets. I mean, if I deregulate the speed limit on I 10, I could trumpet that I'm a, a deregulated I 10. But let me tell you, at seven in the morning, uh, there's no way you can go as fast as you would want to. And, and so McAvoy and Joskow pointed out that the, these markets, in particular natural gas markets and electricity markets, were having great difficulties with rates of return and, and earning returns for Wall Street. And, and they pointed out that with that type of situation, nobody was going to be reinvesting. And then I bring in uh, Nash and Schubick. Nash, of course, with uh, non-cooperative games. And Schubick, who with the dollar auction theory and uh, his greater experience in, in more games and, and also was Nash's roommate, co-author and colleague, uh, pointed out that you could get irrational outcomes from uh, uh, the Nash rational uh, model. Uh, and so as we, we looked at this, we knew that folks would, would start gaming the system. As, as generation failed to keep up with the growth of Texas, then we would be forced into a short squeeze from time to time where the market could be manipulated, where some of the participants could take advantage of the market. And so we, we talked about that in this little 800 word piece. And then finally, Steve Ross, the Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale at the time, um, uh, arbitrage pricing theory. Uh, if, if there are rates of return that are better in other industries, then money will certainly go in that direction and away from, from yours. Um, but in the situation where, where Texans were, were stuck, uh, we knew that there would be less capital arriving. Uh, Steve was also the co-founder or, or co-developer of the uh, binomial uh, uh, options pricing model and always pointed out that, you know, if you're going to own anything in, in a market, you want to own the volatility. And utilities, the generators, were not going to be able to own the volatility, um, but the consumers were going to wind up paying for it. And so with the, the disaggregation or the disintegration of the electric utilities in Texas, we wound up with um, a competing interest at the retail electricity provider side where, where I give somebody a check. Uh, the local distribution company, in my case, Centerpoint, um, the transmission companies uh, the, and, and the, the LDCs and the transmission companies are fully regulated. And then we've got the uh, generation companies who are kind of left to fend for themselves. So wrapping all of this, uh, uh, these vectors together, if you will, led us to, to write the um, initial piece in 2013. Um, the key characteristics I want everyone to, to focus upon here is that for eight of the past 10 years, the generators have not covered their cost. Um, this is not my data. This is the data from the independent market monitor uh, for ERCOT. And uh, I've summarized this in a little PDF on my website under grid economics. 
just taking the, the snippets from the independent market monitors report over the last uh, 10 years. So in 2011, uh, there was there was a price on or average revenue was greater than than average total cost. That was the year, of course, of the first polar vortex. And then this and, and uh, uh, recently there was a, a slight uh, uh, surplus, if you will. But with price less than average total cost and and average total cost going against every form of new generation you could think of, uh, with without subsidies. You know, that's not the equation that Wall Street's going to, to follow to go ahead and throw more money into a, a market. Um, and the Wall Street Journal and then KPRC uh, Channel 2 both investigated the uh, uh, price uh, uh, issues. And so the retail price that Texans or ERCOT consumers have paid has been $28 billion more than they would have paid in an old style regulated utility market. So if we pay 28 billion more than anybody else, but have a broken market, it kind of begs the question of where that 28 billion dollars has gone. This is a real problem. And uh, no one in Austin appears to be uh, spending a whole heck of a lot of time looking at this. The, um, uh, I think we've got a couple of clues. The first clue being that the uh, uh, ICE futures U.S. Uh, Commodities Exchange uh, showed up to testify and explain to the legislators uh, uh, what they did and, and what their role was in maintaining the status quo. Uh, also, there's a magnificent recording of the 45-minute call with the chairman of the Public Utility Commission of Texas and the Bank of America, in which he, um, uh, in Texas, we would say is clearly bootlicking uh, the Bank of America. Um, and, and so as, as we go forward, you know, what is the primary characteristic of, of the ERCOT market? It's electricity only. And so in a, in a monopsony market, in a, in a old style Soviet market, you know, we're just looking at, at real time, this, this instant. And so if we, we equate this to say a baseball team, if we had the Astros on the field, uh, which we will, I guess, Thursday night, uh, only those 10 guys taking the field would get paid. Those on the bench would not get paid. And, and that's the ERCOT market characteristic, the primary characteristic. They made some little tweaks, but this is it. This is the key one. And, and so they, they, they bid in. Uh, and as a result, they're, they're not making anything more than basically variable cost coverage. Um, and you know, I, I want to take issue with the number of folks who uh, talk about the uh, uh, deregulated characteristics of the ERCOT market. Uh, first of all, we know that it's restricted entry. Uh, there used to be kind of a restricted exit, but uh, when companies began filing bankruptcy to take their generators offline, ERCOT learned that they couldn't restrict uh, exits. Uh, there's restricted information. Uh, there's no transparency. Uh, pricing is controlled by ERCOT. Um, this is not an open bid system. It's a monopsonist facing the generators. And as we've learned uh, very painfully, ERCOT's a monopolist facing consumers. It is characterized by uh, price manipulation. I see in the Q&A here, there's some issues with that. Um, and there's no accountability. In other words, you know, these are all political appointees. Um, the, the ERCOT market has been subject to allegations of price manipulation since 2003. Uh, in 2013, uh, the independent market monitor pointed out that one participant had, had very clearly uh, taken about $300 million off the top of the market. There have been numerous lawsuits filed against ERCOT uh, for allowing uh, market manipulation. And in fact, in the June issue, when um, uh, apparently 15% of generation did not show up for work, uh, ERCOT uh, likened it to, to going out and finding a flat tire on your car in the morning. Uh, but honestly, 15% of the generation is, is, is a ridiculously high number for just uh, ordinary flat tires. And ERCOT, uh, the spokesman, um, uh, pointed out that they were going to investigate if, if there had been any market manipulation. ERCOT doesn't have really any transparency into ICE or into uh, 
uh, NYMEX, which is a unit of, of CME group that allows uh, or cut contracts to trade. I think there's an awful lot of, of, of um, smoke and mirrors here that consumers in Texas really aren't seeing. So uh, the ERCOT market going going further into this, it, it is and always has been regulated, you know, 1,876 pages of rules and regulations, which they, they don't actually uh, pay attention to, as we know. Um, you know, why are Texans afraid of complete deregulation? And McAvoy and I had called for that in our piece in 2013. Um, you know, I'm required to work through a retail electricity provider. I can't go and contract directly with one of the generators. Um, that's uh, this, this kind of layering of, of different parties uh, causes all sorts of, of differing constituencies and, and, and nobody's clearly aligned with what I would like to have, which is reliable electricity. Uh, certainly, Ice Futures U.S. is not aligned with what I would like as a consumer, and the Bank of America is clearly not aligned with what I would like as a consumer. Um, uh, these parties have, have no business making electricity in Texas, and so there's really a, 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 a motivational question. You know, what, what are the costs, the benefits, the, the directives here? Um, the uh, solution is clearly uh, break up the functions of ERCOT. ERCOT performs two functions. One is it manages the physical grid and uh, has, has issues doing that, but then does it with, with the, also being the financial market maker, uh, sets the price, uh, acts as the, the clearing agent, um, uh, qualifies the financial players. Uh, you know, this is, this is an interesting issue here, and, it, and it's clearly under the control of the governor. The governor had his own uh, staff members in the ERCOT control room during uh, uh, in Taylor during Winter Storm Uri. Uh, the chairman, uh, then chairman of the Public Utility Commission, was also physically on site. Um, you know, maybe it's just more than they can quite manage. Uh, you know, LMP pricing, locational marginal pricing. You know, that, that you know, step back, take a global look at it, and the, and the common sense with with the nodes across Texas. That, you know, there at any one time there are more than four million possible combinations, and and it's just a ridiculous sort of way to try and and, and manage a grid that is is truly important. Uh, this grid is is half again larger than California's grid. It is uh, larger than most nations, and um, running everything by a, a, a glorified Excel spreadsheet is simply not the way to uh, um, think about it. I want to go and, and, and extend this because the problems aren't just there in, in ERCOT. Uh, you know, I was in New York a week and a half ago. I was greeted by an emergency power alert. Uh, it was nice of them to make me feel at home. Uh, there were blackouts across Brooklyn and the Bronx and Queens, uh, fortunately uh, not for too damn very long. Uh, but as, as, as McAvoy found in uh, uh, you know, back in, in 03, 04 timeframe, the basis differential between Connecticut and Maine, for example, just on the, on the power production and, and transmission uh, led to these disruptions uh, of price across two markets that were generally well connected. And then the same in, in California, of course, everybody's familiar with the 2000, uh, 2001 uh, problems. Uh, and and again, again, we've got more issues going on in California today with, with their market. They have uh, uh, followed a, a, an electricity-only market to, to a large extent. Certainly, they have a capacity market, but that hasn't provided the assurance that they need for a reliable grid. They've accelerated retirements of, of coal and nuclear plants, and uh, the renewable fleet is not there yet. But California, as, as we had pointed out in 2013, had also opted to bring in lots of, of supply from other states. Uh, on any given day, California is importing 35% of its electricity, and they found that there is a systemic risk if a, if a heat wave hits all of its neighbors at the same time then uh, this interconnection and, and interreliability is everybody kind of hives down to a just-in-time uh, structure of, of generation and supply can be terribly stressed. And uh, 
they, you, we can add this uh, uh, facet, I guess, to the, the added uh, uh, complexity of the drought and the fact that some of the hydro uh, generation is coming offline in California. Uh, yesterday, Elliot Mainzer, who's the CEO of uh, Kaiso, pointed out it's going to take a couple of years of really working nonstop to bring more capacity online to the California market. Um, and so, uh, you know, I want to get to again for eight of the past ten years, for generators, the price has been less than average total cost in ERCOT. Um, you know, this is the shutdown rule that we learned. It's on the first or second page of a microeconomics text. Uh, politicians tend to, to avoid this, this particular discussion. Uh, the third rail in, in American politics is if the, uh, if, if the price goes up at the meter or the price goes up at the gasoline pump, nobody gets reelected. Um, we've seen that recently in the last administration and, and all, you know, through the seventies. And, and now it's really kind of coming home to roost. Had ERCOT uh, followed the recommendations by the North American Electric Reliability Corporation in 2011 and uh, uh, been able to enact some reforms across the market, change the way the market was working, uh, increase uh, the wholesale price from an average of, of three cents per kilowatt hour to four cents or four and a half cents per kilowatt hour, then Texas would not find itself in the situation it is today. Um, here is a, um, a, a snippet from one of the Public Utility Commission uh, hearings that ran in the news last week. Peer pressure is a real deal, um, and, and public eyes on, on these uh, individual events may have a benefit for our purposes. So, yeah, I think we should consider it. You know, you know guys, peer pressure, uh, just naming companies that, that don't have generation to show up. This is a this is a terrible indictment of of, of leadership. You know, uh, the, the grid is not something that's run like a country club or a fraternity. And um, I'll swear I'm not sure how Texas is going to get through this. Um, and I've I've got some uh, uh, you know, the, the the final point is for for additional resources. Um, I've got things on, on my website um, uh, and then uh, McAvoy's uh, seminal work uh, in 2007, which is a Yale Press book. And it's also on the Social Science Research Network. You know, these concepts and principles are all the same. Um, guys, I am, I am back, I apologize. Something, we had a, we had a blip there. Um, so, um, there were there were some questions in the in the Q and A that I have have lost. Uh, what rates of return would the various markets need to make to provide elect, reliable electricity? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Vollmer. The uh, rates would need to you know be enough to cover cost. And uh, given that electric utilities have not been in the, in the forefront of making great rates of return, they've, they've got to be higher. And so if, if we know that the initial investment on a levelized cost of electricity basis is, is going to be four cents a kilowatt hour, then the generator is going to have to earn something more than four cents a kilowatt hour to get there. Um, and let me see, other, other questions. I, uh, re, you know, Rebecca, I lost those as um, uh, this thing. Ah, there we go. Yes, I did lose the earlier questions, so. Um, let's see. So, um, other questions. Uh, let's see. Per, per, here's the first question. Per the ERCOT SARA reports, the thir total thermal generation right now is only about 70 gigawatts. Uh, actually, that's not the case. Um, the May report for ERCOT showed that the uh, best they could hope for this summer is about 64 gigawatts uh, with everything running. Uh, and peak demand estimated to be about 77 gigawatts. Um, ERCOT says that they've got 86 gigawatts of, of supply capacity they can draw upon, uh, but that's, that's quite uh, questionable. Um, the uh, 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 there is a, a full dependence upon uh, the renewables uh, uh, fleet coming into play. 
Uh, for those of us who live in Texas, we know that the hottest days in Texas are those when it doesn't, uh, uh, the wind doesn't blow. Um, and, and, and to be fair, ERCOT is in a situation where it has to follow the rules. You know, the one thing that CEO Magnus said during the hearings that, that rings true is, if you want us to play by different rules, give us different rules. Um, the, uh, uh, it's, it's, you know, in many respects, ERCOT is, is pushing on a string and um, some of the players uh, in the ERCOT market can take advantage of this. Uh, what regulatory response do I suggest specifically at the federal level? Um, you know, I, I don't know that we could actually put the Texas grid into receivership, but the uh, vested interest in maintaining the status quo of, of this grid are uh, remarkable. Uh, NBC5 in Dallas pointed out that uh, with the, the grid failure, suddenly there are 300 uh, lobbyists and, and in an interim report, um, having spent almost $30 million uh, lobbying the um, uh, legislators uh, to maintain things as, as they are essentially. Um, you know, State Senator uh, Kelly Hancock uh, again pointed out that, uh, yeah, the SB3, SB2 and SB3, the, the Senate bills that were passed regarding the grid are, are purposely vague. They wanted to turn everything over to the experts at the PUC and ERCOT to fix. Um, I don't know that the PUC and ERCOT really have all of the tools necessary to uh, ensure a stable uh, uh, grid going forward and certainly not um, stability in the eyes of Wall Street. You know, there's a reason there's the Dow Jones Utilities Index uh, because utilities uh, had stable cash flows, predictable cash flows. And in Texas, we don't have that. Uh, this has been the Wild West with multiple bankruptcies, not just among the generation companies, but among the retail electricity providers. Um, you know, this type of stability chases away capital. Uh, and, and the opportunities for, for big returns uh, to, to, you know, essentially compensate for that risk, it, it's just not available and certainly not the way this market is structured. Um, do, 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 do. And uh, manipulation theme is not a red herring. It is a, it is a real challenge, as anybody in the market will tell you. Um, there's, there's clear evidence of this. Uh, ERCOT has admitted this. Uh, ERCOT allows it. And uh, when you have pivotal suppliers, I mean, this is laid out in the Independent Market Monitors report. And, you know, you, know, you don't have to take my word for it and you go read the reports. Um, uh, doesn't the fact that consumers have paid 20 billion more than they should have, and that's prior to 2021, uh, indicate that at least this year generator revenues will, will exceed actual total cost. And no, that's not true because the, the, the 28 billion is the retail number. It's what goes into the retail electricity provider and what gets to the generation company is, is not that number. Um, uh, the middlemen out on the corner there are, are taking their share or in some cases they're not. For example, one of the uh, former PUC uh, chairs, his retail electricity providing company uh, filed for bankruptcy because they didn't appropriately hedge. Uh, you, you would think that these guys would know better, but, but they didn't. Um, and uh, uh, generators, transmitters, distributors uh, actually earn. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the numbers, and so I haven't done a, a disaggregate uh, uh, analysis of the uh, LDCs, the transmission companies, and um, um, the generators. We do know that for many years, uh, the, the, the grid was um, managed primarily by attorneys with right-of-way companies. They were, uh, there were three of them on the Public Utility Commission, and so every, every solution to a problem of not having enough generation was met by a new wire. Uh, the, the Houston import project, which was, I think, a $1.2 billion uh, wire that was uh, to bring down electricity from North, North Texas to, to Houston, uh, was competing against a, a, a generation plant pr proposed by Calpine and NRG. Um, they would have spent 600 plus million dollars to build a generation facility, which of course under the Texas market as electricity only would have only been charging the consumers when they were actually turning and spinning electricity into the grid. Instead, the PUC went in favor of the 
uh, of the transmission line uh, for which all of Texans had to pay a, a guaranteed return to the uh, uh, folks who built and, and owned that line. Um, how will we find out where the overcharges from the 2021 freeze went? I don't know. We're going to have to wait. Uh, I think we're going to learn a lot in the uh, litigation and the, and the bankruptcies. Again, there was a, a Bloomberg report um, earlier this week that pointed out that $11 billion uh, apparently went to natural gas uh, companies in, in Texas. Um, you know, this, this, uh, uh, I, I'm not altogether certain how the natural gas supplies could be maintained to the level of, of 98, 99% for residential customers. And yet the commercial customers somehow found themselves wanting uh, gas, especially uh, in our research at the University of Houston, we found that many of the natural gas plants actually were listed as critical infrastructure. Um, and, and there's a there's a serious disconnect right now in the um, uh, allegations and accusations that are flying around. Uh, uh, again, this is going to take some time to, to figure it out. Um, is there a deregulator where it has a direct generator to end user like you were advocating? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not certain. Uh, uh, you know, certainly in a, in, if we deregulated the Texas market, I think we would see a reassembling of electric utilities vertically uh, very quickly. Uh, and we would, of course, see a, uh, potentially a higher price, but I don't know that it'd be $28 billion more. Uh, you know, these, these are analyses that um, uh, probably need to be done as we go forward. Uh, let's see, any other questions over here? Um, uh, oh, other comments? No. Um, anything else, guys? Well, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, to Rebecca and uh, we'll, we'll wind it up here. I'm very easy to find at uh, edhers.com and uh, be happy to, to speak with anybody offline. IAEE wishes to thank Ed Hers for an outstanding webinar. This webinar will be available on IAEE's website for future download. If you're not a member of IAEE, we encourage you to join by visiting www.iaee.org. We thank you for attending, and I officially close this webinar.